It's great to have you here on the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you so you make better financial decisions in your life. I'm stopped all the time by people asking me about the stock market and where I think things are headed. And I'm going to share some thoughts to begin today's show on that. And also, I'm going to talk to you about two ways of paying for items over time that I need you to just say no to. All right. A lot of fuss where people have a hard time with good times with the stock market. We've had an incredible run up in the market through so many things. If you go back through this century, I guess that would be this millennium, you go back through what's happened over these last, uh, if you technically go 23 years, but let's go back to 2000. Which is the last year of the last century, I think is the way that works. Is that right, Krista? We, we have people who are arguing about this 20-something years ago when we hit Y2K. Um, you look at all the things that happened over the years. We had the dot bomb bust. We had the brutality of 9-11. We had the Great Recession. We had COVID. What have I missed? The world always will have unexpected events, good, tragic, terrible, just bad. It'll have recessions. It'll have, uh, hopefully not depressions, boom times, exhilaration, and then too much pessimism and everything in between. We have been on an incredible roll with the market in recent years in particular. And there's a lot of predictions based on how overvalued stocks are in the U.S. by historical measurements that you should run for the hills, head for the hills. So my thing is always, are you properly diversified? And diversified doesn't just mean you're in different funds, but different kinds of things too. You know, do you have money in real estate? Do you have money in big companies, small companies in between, and stock type holdings? Or is your money spread out and not buying stories? You know what story stocks are? Tesla is a perfect example of a story stock that people are buying the story. And maybe the story will have a happy ending or maybe it won't. But Tesla, which has had a huge run up just recently, its value is based on it being far more than an automaker. And maybe it'll turn out to be that. But that's a high risk story. Do I own Tesla stock? No, only indirectly I do own it through the index funds I'm in. My whole thing is spreading risk out. I'm not looking for the home run. If you want to look for the home run, that's your thing. I'm about creating long-term financial security. So I own, uh, I love the total stock market index, which owns little pieces of big companies, small companies, and in between in the US. And even though the market has not been kind, I still hold on to owning international. Because the values of stocks much lower in terms of what you get paid for the earnings. And so there's more potential there, potentially over time. But it's really all about diversifying risk. I own bond funds. I own real estate. I own so many different types of assets rather than making 
bets that are concentrated and narrow. Not my thing. So are we going to have a correction? We'll always have corrections. We have bear markets, which is much worse than a correction. That's a decline of 20% or more in markets. Yes, we will. Do I think that U.S. markets are overvalued? Yeah. Does that make me want to sell out? No, because you cannot time markets, period. I meant to read this before you did that segment, but I'll just quickly read to Chris in Tennessee. You've advised to invest into an index S&P 500 fund outside of retirement investing. One of the giant monster mega banks just announced to expect a 3% annual return going forward. This is far from the 11%. I should so, can I stop you right there yeah. and say who it is. It's Goldman Sachs. And they expect an after inflation return over the next decade of 1% a year, 3% not adjusting for inflation. Right. And he said, this is far from the 11% return from the past decades. I never try to time the market. But is this an indicator to take a different investment past? I'm a little anxious about this announcement. Would appreciate your advice. And I can't thank you enough for all your guidance over the years. My daughter is a senior in college and off to grad school. And my 529 will cover it all thanks to your advice. This and all of your investment and travel tips have made a big difference to my family. Thank you very much for that, Chris. And so here's the thing. Time in the market is what matters. And so, yeah, what you're talking about, what Goldman Sachs is talking about, reversion to mean. That if stock returns have been historically uh, above average, then you have a period uh, below average returns. But we don't know, is that starting in 25? Is that starting in 26, 27? So it's hard to know. And there are reasons why um, the returns may actually not go as slow as Goldman Sachs thinks because we have such an enormous focus on technology and we're leading the world. Our market share of technology around the world is so large that, that we may be in a cycle where returns stay higher than normal for potentially years to come. But the, the best defense against this is my obsession with dollar cost averaging. That if you are putting money in regularly, every paycheck, every month, whatever, in retirement accounts and in traditional investment accounts, you are riding the ups and downs, the bumps in the market, and you just go steady as you go. And so I am comfortable staying in my mix of investments that is very widely diversified. And I'm not making any changes at all because of the scare lines surrounding Goldman's announcement. Brad in Florida says, I'm a high school personal finance teacher. And as you would expect, I teach the kids the benefits of investing in a Roth IRA and 401k starting at an early age. The popularity of the Good standard retirement investments like target date funds and S&P 500 funds combined with the fact that people get taught this at a young age now, combined with the fact that many employers are now auto-enrolling people, I'm starting to wonder if this is one of the reasons the stock market is currently way overvalued by all indication indicators. What are your thoughts on this? And if you think this is true, is this a sustainable way for everyone to save for retirement? So what a thoughtful question. And I've thought about this myself. You know, does this emphasis on individuals, small investors, owning more and more of the market lead to it being inflated, and particularly with the target retirement funds and the index funds, because they're, they're, uh, the index funds are passive choices just set by what are the 500 largest companies or 1,000 largest companies or whatever index they're using. And then with the target funds, many of them being a mix of index funds, you got this investing going on automatic pilot. So with an aging population, I've decided I'm not that worried about it because we're in a stage where as people come into the workforce, we right now potentially have more people leaving the workforce starting to withdraw from the funds that they accumulated over the years. And so I'm feeling like we're, at an, we're getting to a point with an equilibrium 
that you're not going to have to worry significantly about people as individuals going into index funds and target retirement funds distorting values in the market because money is starting to roll out of the market too from individuals. Just my guess. AR in Georgia says with the latest hurricanes and flood damage, is it safe to buy a new or used car? Undoubtedly, both new and used car dealers and individuals have suffered damage. Thank you. And we've not talked about this following Helene and Milton. And again, to the people suffering so much from the nearly back-to-back hurricanes, my heart goes out to you. It is a life-changing event that for many people is hard to overcome when all the things that felt stable in your life suddenly get swept away, including maybe a loved one who uh, passed away or was injured from one of the hurricanes. And so this is an after effect that I've held off talking about so far, but I was going to talk about it in just a few weeks. The thing about cars, that there's a big problem with states that don't have good titling laws where people literally, uh, the term, it's a figurative term, but what they do is they wash the title. They move it through a state motor vehicle department that doesn't have tight controls and a vehicle that has been flooded out suddenly is back in the market as a used vehicle and you're buying trouble not realizing that it was reconditioned to look good, but you're buying nothing but a rusting hulk underneath. So the problem for new is not significant because of state lemon laws. If a dealer sells a new vehicle that has been through a flood and sells it to you as if it's a fine new car, uh, you would be able with the manufacturer when problems start to appear to do a lemon law buyback. And nothing like that exists for used vehicles. That's why in a cycle following a hurricane or a major flood, it is far more important than even normal times to have it checked out by an independent mechanic of your choosing before you buy a vehicle or if you buy from CarMax or Carvana where you have the time period you can return it for a full refund. In that time period, in that trial period, have it inspected by a mechanic of your choosing who will be able to spot telltale signs that the vehicle has been through a flood. This is serious stuff because a lot of dirty players chase the money and sell to unsuspecting buyers vehicles that have been flood damaged. Coming up ahead, I want to talk about dirty dealing. With your holiday shopping coming up, ways you're going to be enticed to pay that you should not use. An earthquake has just hit the paying for industry in the United States. Chase Bank, which is the, I think they're the largest credit card issuer in the country, if not American Express, but they're ginormous in credit cards. Chase, which the rest of the industry tends to follow in lockstep, has now banned you making payments to the pay and for apps by doing any kind of cash advance or anything against your Chase credit cards. Why? Because the pay in for has been a disaster, disaster for people's personal finances. Because what happens is people dig a debt hole. And then they're trying to transfer that debt hole to Chase and they're like, no dice. You're not doing that. You're not going to default on our credit card because you're looking at defaulting on the pay in four and you're transferring that risk to us. Pay in four is terrible. And everywhere you go online, everywhere. I saw it the other day at a tire center. Pay in four. Oh man, do I despise 
paying for? At the register at a retailer. I mean, it's just about, it's, who knows, at some point, restaurants for expensive meals are going to offer you paying for as an option. Disaster. Disaster. Because they say, for easy payments. A lot of times, no interest. Yeah. So, you got roughly a one in three chance you're going to mess up with a pay in four. One in three. You're not going to pay on time. Your credit's going to be trashed. You're going to be paying the equivalent of interest and all the fees that happen and ultimately potentially ending up in the hands of a bill collector. And what pay in four, the reason it's so popular with online sellers and retailers is that you buy things, it pushes you over the line. You buy things you might not have bought otherwise. You may already be wheezing a bit from your credit cards. And you're like, I better not charge any more on the cards. I think I'll put that back. And then there's the sign saying, for easy payments. Easy for who or whom? Whichever I'm supposed to say. Don't do it. Okay, that's rule number one. And I'm not usually into like firm, absolute. Maybe somebody on Clark Stinks will say, I'm missing something. There's a situation that would be okay to use pay in for. Maybe. Okay. Other one? 90 days, same as cash. One year, same as cash. The furniture stores, two years, same as cash. Known in the lingo of the trade as no, no, no plans. The no, no, no I want you to know is you don't use them. Okay. The way no, no, no plans are set up is they count on consumer behavior. You buy whatever on the no, no, no plan. The big screen TV, the furniture, whatever it is. And you get the interest-free period. But in almost all no, no, no plans, if you don't have it paid in full before the date that represents uh, eight, you know, 90 days, 180 days, one year, whatever, you don't get it paid before that's up. The interest is retroactive to the day you originally made that purchase and nobody pays any attention to what the interest rate's going to be on that no, no, no plan. Because in your mind, when you're buying it, you're going to pay it off before that period is up. A lot of times people forget about it. Or whatever the circumstance, you don't have the money. And then it springs back retroactive. And the interest will be very interesting, somewhere 35 to 40 percent on that no, no, no plan. If you at that moment, you were taking out the no, no, no plan to buy whatever, if you thought in your head, huh, this is 35 percent interest, do I really want to pay 35 percent? In other words, think about instead of how we normally process as humans, where you are only thinking about, hey, they're going to let me have the use of their money for a year for free or six months for free and it making you feel like the purchase is better and you should do it, don't. No, no, no. Hey, you know the funniest thing about no, no, no's? Do you know what the retailer does with the no, no, no paper? They sell the paper immediately at a big discount to somebody who then shoulders the risk, who then is hoping they're going to make a big amount of money from all the people who don't get the plans paid off in time. So remember, the retailer sold you something at whatever price. But then they're not really getting that price because they're having to discount the paper to who they sell it to who carries it. 
So you're paying more for whatever it is you're buying up front, even if you get it paid off in time, than you would if you just simply bought whatever it is you're buying at a better deal from a place that isn't dangling in front of you a no, no, no plan. All right. I'm just no fun. I am Ebenezer Scrooge already in November, aren't I? Not true, not true. Okay. I, I think I am. We'll go to some questions okay. now. Tara in Connecticut says, first, thanks for being a broken record on freezing credit reports as I finally did it last month and now I'm trying to convince my family to follow suit. Recently, I went on a trip to London to celebrate my 60th birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. You only look like you're about 45, though. Prior to leaving, I verified online that my Amex Gold card doesn't charge foreign transaction fees. As a result, I felt comfortable using my Amex in lieu of my visa for the week-long trip. That is until my recent statement was issued, and Amex assessed me significant foreign transaction fees, in particular with my hefty hotel charge. When I called them, they advised me that I have a traditional gold card, which charges such fees. While I'm fully aware of the offering of the differing benefit levels between their green, gold, and platinum cards, I was perplexed as I didn't know there were varying tiers of their gold cards. In fact, their current green card doesn't charge for foreign transaction fees, whereas my gold card does. As a 35-year customer, I can't help but feel duped by Amex, and I'm considering closing my account. What do you think of this scenario, and do you have any suggestions for me and your followers? Yeah, I mean, uh, American Express, if you go to their website and you go to the pick a card thing, it is so confusing because gold isn't necessarily the only gold, and platinum isn't the only platinum, and... They've got all these different colors and all these different offers and all these different partners for them. And so the color no longer means what it used to mean at American Express. Uh, as an example, an American Express Platinum is completely different than the Delta Sky Miles American Express Platinum. There, there's no similarity between the two of them. And so with Amex, the one time you have their attention is at the time that your annual fee is due and you say, I'm not going to renew. And at that moment, the retention specialist may say, why? And you say, because I got ripped off by you and I was charged and give the specific amount that you were charged and I got blown off when I called about it. And so at that point, you may get some satisfaction. The other thing you could do is you could file a complaint at BBB.org. American Express considers itself and uh, pretty much is a very legitimate company. And so they don't like to have a bad rep with the Better Business Bureau. You could file a BBB.org complaint, and American Express may, as a one-time concession to you, may give you back the foreign currency transaction fees. But it's kind of inexcusable that it's so hard to know with what all the things the marketing people at American Express have come up with and how they're trying to slice so many different sub-markets that the actual benefits of a card are so hard to decipher now at American Express. I've heard CVS and Walgreens offer more affordable doctor's visits. Upon researching, I came across their CVS Minute Clinic and Walgreens Health Care Clinic. Are these viable options for budget-friendly yearly physicals? Will I save a lot of money going this route? I'd also appreciate advice on the cheapest ways to get blood work, as it's often the most expensive part of the process. Does it work the same with the blood work where CVS or Walgreens will call me with the results or is there a different procedure? As a healthy 50-year-old man with no family health issues and no insurance, I'm exploring my options. Would you recommend these clinics or are there other similar affordable alternatives that I should consider? Okay, that was a lot of stuff all at once. Uh, so if I miss anything, please remind me. So CVS and Walgreens have both struggled Walgreens more than CVS, with providing uh, medical services, uh, pay, you know, traditional patient visits at select locations. Uh, CVS 
uh, has the Minute Clinic, but they have morphed the strategy from where there used to be a very clear price schedule for everything, and you'd know what your ultimate bill would pretty much be. Uh, Walgreens has, in a lot of markets, has given up and turned the spaces over to a dual-branded Walgreens tied in with one of the hospital systems in a market that the hospital wants to be in there as a feeder for hospital-owned specialty practices and for patient admissions ending up at their hospital versus another one. The prices are no longer clear and consistent with CVS and Walgreens, which brings me to the other part you asked. When you are uh, do not carry insurance and you are having to have lab work, you don't know it's a complete roll of the dice where that lab work will be sent off from. Because remember, the bills are not coming from the Minute Clinic at CVS or the Walgreens, if it has a, a doctor kind of office, or any place you'd go, whether it's a standalone doc in a box or a traditional doctor practice. They send them out to the labs, and the labs have retail prices for people who don't have insurance, and then they have um, insurance negotiated prices for people who do. So the lab work is a complete shot in the dark. And I don't know, have you ever heard of a way to know up front what a lab is going to charge? No. What about uh, Amazon, the Amazon health thing? That the you Amazon of? thing um, that, that I'm in, um, you pay an annual fee if you're an Amazon Prime member, but it's very cheap to be in one medical, which used to be an independent company, but is now owned by Amazon. And so we have it as a family membership. And I've found that for routine stuff, it's been very good at availability of talking to someone, being able to get appointments. You do so much online. But I don't know that, and I can look in my app later, and I can talk about it another time, if they'll tell you up front through their lab that they send things to whoever they contract with, if you know prices up front, if you don't carry health insurance. But this is a problem in medicine that it'd be like eating a meal and finding out later what the charges are. That's the way medicine generally works. Jeffrey in Connecticut says, so it's best not to purchase gold from Costco per Clark's advice, but if you do, what's the best way to sell it? Okay, so it's funny you asked this the way you did because you just stated what the problem is. There's nothing wrong. In fact, Costco is the best place in America, hands down, to buy physical gold. Because Costco does it the Costco way. They're giving you a crazy low cost in addition to the what they pay for the pure gold that you're paying. Cheaper than anywhere else any day. The problem is that Costco won't buy back your gold. And so then you're in the free market, and there are no good deals in the market for selling physical gold. That's why gold you have needs to be, when you do buy it, as a hedge against trouble in the world, you need to have that gold for a long, long, long time so that you uh, reduce the impact to your wallet of the fees. You know, there are people who buy physical gold, short order, sell it. Buy it again, sell it again. You're getting just clobbered on the huge commissions involved with normally the buy, Costco, you don't have that, but always on the sell. So you just have to shop around and see what the least harmful commission is you can find on selling gold. It's why I love buying gold funds instead of gold, where easily you can buy in at any time, sell at any time, at extremely low cost, almost no cost, for the buy or the sell. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today. 
And this is a, a big week in the United States, election week. And Chris, I'm going to say it again. Get ready for the Clark Stinks. Regardless of whether your candidate or your party emerges no, uh, victorious, this is a strong country, and we will be fine regardless. I believe in the United States. I love this country. I'm so glad that I can wake up every day and know that I live in the greatest country, in my opinion, the world has ever known. And so we will be fine. I know it. And I know also <laughs> that the Clark Stakes are a coming. But know what we're about. You learning ways to save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off. See you tomorrow.